Hi, this is Paul Slackus. I'm speaking to Ken Goldstein. Hello, Ken. How are you? Fine. How are you, Paul? Okay, good. Ken actually uh, does lots of different kinds of things, and uh, one some of them are advises startups and established corporations in technology, entertainment, media, and e-commerce. He served as a CEO and chairman of the board of Shop.com, executive VP and managing director of Disney Online, VP of entertainment at uh, Broderbund uh, Software, and you teach, and, uh, and you've written a, a new book called This Is Rage. Okay, a novel of Silicon Valley and other madness by Ken Goldstein. Okay. <laughs> wow, thanks. What, well, a great can... introdu- what a great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of an interruption uh, introduction. Uh, well, here's the interruption, though. Okay, so how does a guy who's my dad taught me a lot of important stuff, he taught me where we came from and never to forget that. He taught me you can't work too hard, be too honest, or laugh enough often enough. He taught me to stare down injustice and unmask arrogance. He taught me to it was okay to be me, which wasn't always easy, but always was right. How does a man like that who's been taught by his dad write a book that there's some situations here that are it's a novel, I guess. Is that, is that the uh, reality here or is this a reality of the book? Well, you know, what do they say? Uh, you know, uh, truth is truth and fiction is fiction, and uh, there's something in between. Uh, and thank okay. you for quoting that passage, because uh, uh, that passage that you read is from the acknowledgments. And uh, actually, a lot of people have picked up on that, a very little paragraph uh, buried there in the middle of the, uh, of the opening, but, uh, or the pre-opening. But, uh, yeah, a lot of the ethics uh-huh. are there. Um, you know, I, I wanted to tell a great story, and... Uh, you know, uh, uh, focus on interesting characters and uh, and then kind of peel back the curtain a little bit. And uh, all of those uh, values or all of those observations, uh, the things that ground me, uh, I think both ground my work, they ground my work as an executive, they ground my work as a consultant and an investor, and they also ground my work as an author. Aha. Uh-huh. Now, you've gotten some uh, pushes to do this. Uh, you had Michael Eisner, uh uh, a legend and a living legend. Yeah. Well, Michael, uh, Michael is a fantastic mentor and uh, probably the, the the greatest creative executive. Certainly, the greatest creative creative executive I know. And honestly, I know a lot of them, so I'm going to put him at number one because he knows how to uh, he knows how to get at the root of issues. And he was very very encouraging of uh, of uh, this journey for me and gave me great feedback uh, during the early drafts. Uh-huh. Well, what is this place, uh, Silicon Valley? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, well, yeah, it's a pretty place. I've been there. Right? Uh, but what is it? How, how how did the culture of, uh, let's call it tech, is tech a good word for that area? Yeah, I think tech's a good word. Uh, I mean, I think there's sort of... Uh, Sort of three levels of uh, of Silicon Valley per se. You know, level one is the beautiful place that a lot of people remember in the geography and the sort of simpler, uh, you know, pre-IPO world. I guess uh, anything before uh, before uh, Intel, which pr- pretty much kicked off the the changes in the valley. But it's a beautiful place and uh, kind of everything. The Bay Area is beautiful, and how could it not be, right, with the with the the geography and the landscape and such. The second mm-hmm. Silicon Valley uh, is really that. You know, Silicon Valley is not an official uh, geographic name. It's kind of a kind of a name that was uh, used in the colloquial uh, dialogue uh, to refer to it. And that's really what what happened uh, since uh, you know the world of uh, venture capital and uh, and uh, investment banking uh, and now politics uh, converge uh, to create tremendous tremendous amounts of wealth and, and change in our society, creative destruction, and all the fallout that uh, occurs, good and bad, from that. And kind of the third tier of Silicon Valley is the philosophical, uh, you know, what we would also sort of, I guess, refer to Hollywood as. Hollywood is both a place they make movies and a, and a way of making movies, a studio way of making movies. And Silicon Valley is that as well, which is, yeah, there's a Phil- Silicon Valley proper, and I think everybody would like to think everything in the world that's important in tech happens there. Uh, but there's interesting things happening everywhere. There's interesting things happening in uh, in India. There's interesting things happening in China. There's interesting things happening in New York. I just got back from Dubai. There's interesting things happening there. And the whole sort of idea of get a little uh, capital together, rally behind an idea, 
fail early, fail fast, see if you can make anything of it, and uh, and see if you can get to the next stage of a Series A, and then eventually some kind of an exit. Uh, that's the philosophical Silicon Valley that's kind of uh, permeated, uh, you know, the the ethos of uh, of the whole world that we live in. The title is "This Is Rage," okay? Uh, so, uh, are you upset with that place? <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, I've, I'm, I've always got my point of view. <laughs> I think there are some things that are that are a little wacky, uh, but uh, the title—I don't want to don't give any spoilers away. But the title refers to uh, one of the characters and and kind of something he's got going, uh, very specifically. And uh, he's got some issues, and uh, he's a little angry about some stuff. And he finds a way to get people at large uh, to pay attention to him and uh, kind of form a movement around that. Uh, it starts out in the book as kind of a quiet rage, the sitting in your cubicle trying to figure out, uh, you know, where you fit into the big equation. Why is the why are the top guys walking away with, uh, you know, millions of dollars while tens of thousands of people are being laid off and don't quite understand what that's all about? Uh, and then it goes from being a quiet rage to being kind of uh, more of a more of an active uh, set of actions. Uh, uh, not so much in the in the uh, anything that would 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 you know be violent or anything like that, but just in kind of saying, you know what, we can't just sit here and and sit on our hands and let all this happen. We got to express ourselves. And this uh, one character, Chemo Balthazer, who's kind of the, the one of the main characters of the story, uh, gets them riled up and they go do some stuff. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I don't have uh, uh, quite as many issues as Chemo, but I guess I got a couple. Okay, and who is it, Chemo? Chemo is uh, is a uh, kind of a flunk out uh, talk show host. He actually was at the top of his game in uh, New York and Los Angeles, but he shot off his mouth one time too many. Wound up in Fresno, couldn't keep his mouth shut again, and wound up off the air there. Uh, and uh, rather than give up his career and sort of uh, you know fall on the sword, he decides to reinvent, reinvent himself as a as a talk show host on internet radio where there are are no rules and it's uh I don't know if you can get fired from your own show on internet radio <laughs> you'd probably know better than I would and uh once he goes and does that uh you know kind of a lot of things start to change and uh kind of a kind of a prediction of uh the uh, kind of leadership I think that might occur at some point when nobody expects it is the internet the wild wild west you know, it it is and it isn't. It's uh, it's becoming awfully mainstream, awfully quickly. Uh, I think that you know certainly the there are no uh, you know there are no federal uh, or I should say there are no global laws that apply. Uh, they keep trying to you know try to put federal laws on it or or even you know some kind of state regulations on it. But the internet doesn't want to be governed. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, I mean, you can, for a while there, you can get away with uh, just about anything you want. Eventually, if you're doing something really bad, I guess they'll find you. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of craziness out there in terms of, uh, you know, just the real, true, uh, far end of democracy, which is anybody can say anything anytime they want. Uh, they can sign it if they want. They don't have to sign it if they don't want. Uh, and then kind of finding that, that, you know, how do you parse that? Where's the truth? Where's the fiction? Where's the person who's spinning it just to spin it? And, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of wildness out there. But this in a sense seems a little wild. Two entrepreneurs turned kidnappers turned antiheroes. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, if you want to go out there and write a wild story, start with a wild premise. There's a lot of satire in the book, and I think some of the reviewers have picked up on that. Um, you know, pay a lot of uh, pay a lot of respect to Tom Wolf and Bonfire of the Vanities. What he tried to do in the mid uh, mid '80s with the whole uh, silliness of the uh, you know the bond market going crazy, and kind of the same thing that I've seen with uh, some of the craziness of uh, the capital markets and how they apply to very young entrepreneurs. And then the other side, the ones who can't get funding, and uh, the ones who can't get funding, uh, there's a certain amount of uh, Gee, how come not me? And a little bit of uh, of envy involved. And in this particular story, a couple of them, uh, you know, kind of convinced themselves that it it wouldn't be the weirdest thing in the world. Uh, you know, just just you know, go go get a guy and uh, and ransom him back. No one will really care. It's just a small amount of money, and uh, we can go start our company that way. Of course, it's a crazy premise, and you know, all kinds of all kinds of bad stuff starts to run downhill after that. How come you wrote the book? 
You know, there's a lot of reasons I wrote the book. Number one is uh, I've I've been just just as I said in the acknowledgement, starved to write again. I've been out uh, doing entrepreneurial things now and different kinds of tech and management things for uh, almost three decades. I started my career as a writer. I wrote a lot when I was very young, and I needed to get back to it. Um, I wanted to write a book because I wanted it to be my own. Uh, I didn't want a lot of people putting their hands on it and telling me what I could or couldn't do, and a novel seemed about the safest way to go about that. And then this particular story, uh, because I think having been a CEO and having had a seat at the table in corporate America, I've had the privilege of certain insights that uh, most people won't get uh, hands-on. They won't get to do it themselves, and I think the the uh, responsibility of a writer is to take you to places that you couldn't get on your own and show you things you couldn't see on your own and then interpret them how you will. Uh, and so I've been in the boardroom and I've been in the venture partners meeting and I've been in the private equity uh, you know, uh, funding stages and uh, been with young entrepreneurs, been one, and seen a lot of this stuff. And uh, so to turn that into fiction, to turn it into a thriller and uh, be able to share that just seemed like the right thing to do at this point in my life and uh, really quite quite a privilege to have the, the flexibility and freedom to do it and to do it in a way that I hope is entertaining. Uh, okay, I have a question to ask you. Do you ever read anything from your book? <laughs> do I ever <laughs> read out loud? Yeah. Or can yeah, I read I, something? Pardon me? You know, do you, uh, do, you, do you have a copy of this here, or you do like reading? Or uh, I do like I reading. Read I don't have the copy in front of me, but I can actually grab okay. one. But I do read, and I, in fact, I just came back from. I've been doing readings for the last month in lots of different cities, and uh, well, grab a copy. I tell you, you let you read it because I tell you, you know, you're not far from that guy John Steinbeck, okay? Pardon you know, me. He's Monterey somewhere. You, you, you guys aren't too far from the guy named Steinbeck. I think he used to write uh, over there, like Monterey. I'm in I'm in L.A. I worked in Monterey for a while, but I live in L.A. proper. Oh, okay. Yeah. I like the way you write. Oh, well, and I, I appreciate like, that. I like that's the way you high, write. That's high that, praise. Thank you for that, Paul. I really appreciate that's that. Your, th- this is a book, right? <laughs> I want to read the first paragraph. You want to read it? Because, well, you, you, maybe you can read it if uh, you care to. No, I'd rather have you read it. I'd love to hear it. I, I get to read all the time, but I'd like you to read it. Silicon Valley parties are notoriously dour, D-O-U-R. Some might call them misfit assemblies accompanied by hot and cold hors d'oeuvres, mixers where thin manners connect the awkward with the hopeful. If you watch the social network in your dorm room, migrated your way to Palo Alto, and thought your clever code would land you a Victoria's Secrets motto, you were playing the, playing for the wrong prize. Forget bikinis, forget bikini waxes, no clinging starlets in lingerie on this peninsula. Truly good wine that you would find in abundance and tension-filled stuffiness in every brief exchange. Quite new money, a quantum inability to fill distinguished between the wackiest of ideas and the next built to last initial public offering and elevator pitches that replaced pleasantries. These are the fabric of high-tech social outings. Conversation is a conduit for data extraction. All else is a causic slide to the next body behind the one currently boring you with an algorithm declared certain for patent award. If that was your idea of a party, you have come to the right place. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. It's good to hear somebody else reading my words. <laughs> that makes me want to read on. So you have a skill. Were you an English major? I actually uh, was a major in uh, theater and in philosophy. So uh, I got, uh, uh, you say if you're going to major in something abstract, major in something twice abstract. So uh, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you'd like to share with us at this moment? You know, I'm just I'm just really really pleased with um the feedback. Uh it's been it's been balanced but very supportive. Uh the the public reviews I've gotten have been just uh, uh you know, I'm I'm humbled. They've been uh, overwhelmingly uh favorable. Uh you know, one of the things that I I tried really hard to do with this book is not write a polemic. 
Uh, I think, uh, and you're very kind in, in uh, no one's made the Steinbeck comparison, so I appreciate that. Uh, there have been some others. Uh, but I tried very hard to let people uh, come up with their own point of view, their own interpretation, and people who have been sort of pro-business have come in saying it's a pro-business book. People have come in saying uh, it's pro-worker, it's pro-people, uh, have taken that point of view. And I think that's what a good story does, is it creates discussion after it's done being read. Uh, and you can read into it what you want, and that there is good in our economy, there's, there's beauty in, in our capitalist system, but there's also a dark downside when it gets out of control. And that, again, looking for that balance, striving for that balance between uh, you know, having, having a wonderful environment where entrepreneurs can go do what they want to go do, but when the madness seeps in and the valuations become ridiculous and the money comes off the table and the human factor, uh, the pain that, that shakes out from that um, isn't, isn't completely uh, taken, you know, taken into account, that's when, that's when the bad stuff happens. And so I'm glad that people are seeing both sides of the story or all sides of the story, and I'm glad people are reading it because when you spend this long reading, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a pretty sizable book, and you spend that much time and you know, checking your facts, and I take you through an IPO and uh, take you through a stock market uh, you know, uh, you know, implosion. When you go to all that work and put it out there, uh, it's very, very good to be embraced and to, to you know, hear that it's touching people and that they're reacting to it. So uh, I'm just very, very, very grateful and um, humbled by all that. There you go. This is Rage. Is that rare book a fascinating, fast-paced, really smart thriller? Says Naomi Wolf. Yeah, well, Naomi and I did a reading together at Poets House in New York about two weeks oh, ago. Oh, is that so? She's awesome. Yeah, awesome. Naomi's great. She's yeah, a she's classmate. Fantastic writer. Oh, is that so? Yeah, Naomi's Well, she's, uh, she's just that the kind of person that you can only imagine would not say anything unless she really wanted to. <laughs> yeah, Naomi, Naomi is 100% authentic all the time, and uh, I'm a huge, huge Naomi fan. I helped her with one of her startups, and... Uh, she helped me uh, with my first novel, so she's terrific, and uh, and she was very gracious to to endorse the book. There you go. Last question: What's good news for you, Ken? Uh, I'm just, I just, you know, on my blog, I just wrote my annual things that uh, I'm thankful for, and uh, this has been a great year for me finishing the book. Um, I signed a two book deal behind it with my fantastic, fantastic publisher, the Story Plant, a uh, small independent publisher with a wonderful uh, guy who heads it up as editor and publisher named Lou Aronica. Uh, he's been great. Uh, i got two startups going. Uh, you know, i got a, a wife who's the greatest wife in the world out, you know, teaching English as a second language, making the world a better place. I'm just very blessed to have this great life. 